Big TV stars, y'all. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the MTA board meeting. This is a call to order. If I could do a quick roll call. Walter Searcy. I'm here. Mary Griffin. Here. And Jessica Dawson. Present. And Gail Carr Williams, present. Um, first on our agenda is approval of the um, December MTA board minutes. If I can have a motion for approval. Motion. I have a motion. And who was the second down on this end? Was that Mary or Jessica? Second. Mm -hmm. Jessica is a second on that. Is there any discussion, any additions, or any deletions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 There we go. We have our minutes. Public comments. I have one public comment request from Mr. Knight, Darius. Welcome, Darius. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah. You're um, ripping the Falcons today. Right. <laughs> Some um, might say why, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not gonna go. There. I just said, <laughs> with the Titans here and all, I don't I'm know. I'm not gonna go. There. That's just for the um, Titans. Oh, we need a little humor every now and then, right? right? It, make, it, 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 it makes it feel good, but we're welcome. It's good to have you. Oh, <laughs> uh, my first off, I want to say, um, Miss Griffin, what you stated about Miss Duff is how I personally felt when I found out she died. That was the first thought that I had is to name the center after her. She was a trailblazer. She was a bus operator like Wego has never had. Um, she was very strong willed and there were unruly customers who could not stand her because she followed every single rule to the T. And so I wanna just remind this board that you're getting an opportunity to name a center in an area that is very historic for African-Americans. And I wanna make it clear that she would be the perfect person to name that center after. But I also have another thought. Senator Thelma Harper, to name it after the both of them, to show the respect of uh, going as far as Tennessee completely, to show that we appreciate all of the women who are trailblazers, who made a way for the next women behind them. Um, to my uh, comments, I would like the staff to be aware that the escalator at Central going up has some issues. Um, I reported that today. Um, and concerning your biannual uh, meetings that were virtual for Zoom, there were quite a few errors. Uh, apparently there was an issue with the first meeting and the second two meetings, I was getting calls from bus operators and other customers stating that they could not log on to Zoom. I feel that that is problematic because these customers were not given an opportunity to voice their opinions virtually as these meetings were set. And it looks very sideways uh, when it comes down to the customers because they personally feel like you all intentionally did that. No matter how many times I've tried to explain, there was an issue that kept them from allowing uh, an easier way to get into the meeting. Um, the other comments that I have uh, are about keeping the buses clean uh, more frequently than what is going on. And I do have a question uh, for staff in terms of the Juvenile Justice Center has made an announcement that they will be moving to Trinity Lane. That area has no service. There is a scheduled uh, Trinity Lane connector uh, but there is no exact time frame due to funding uh, to actually start that route. So I just want to make clear that you might want to make sure that this bus route is in place by the time that center opens up. And lastly, um, your bus operators are getting more and more angrier due to the simple fact that they're being forced to wear their mask and multiple customers are not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knight. And I'm really okay with the Falcons. <laughs> I'm just loving the Titans. <laughs> Are there any other public comments? I have no more records, any more requests. So are there any other public comments? Hearing no further public comments, we will close the public comment section of our agenda. And Mr. Searcy, I'll turn this over to you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're going to start with operations and finance monthly financial report. Uh, and we all know who the star of that show is. Well, thank, thank you, sir. And, and I will say I am not sick. I was a, a big <laughs> participant in the UT Florida basketball game last night in Knoxville and was very boisterous. So uh, excuse my voice. I will be quick due to time and this, this uh, agenda we have on pages 32 through 34. You have the results of operations through November. Uh, we're almost halfway through the year. Uh, I did give a narrative on page 32, uh, and just to highlight that, just as a takeaway, we had a, originally, you know, it's hard to know what to do with the COVID and when we're going to be returning to what's going to be normal. The budget was based on about a 57% of normal, and we're actually running about 76% of normal. So that's a good thing. Um, we hope that that will continue. And then on page 34, uh, just for the transparency sake, at the bottom, you have the aging of the receivables and payables. And we, at, at the end of November, were due about $450,000 from RTA that has been paid. And uh, we owed them about 36,000 for uh, collection of, of fares and things of such that we have paid them as well. So unless there's any questions for the board, from the board, uh, that concludes my report. Ladies. Hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Oliphant. We will now uh, entertain the uh, annual grant application resolution from uh, Mr. Higgins. No, conflict of interest. Are we on conflict of interest? Am I looking at the right thing? Yeah, but I'm... Yeah, but I'm, I'm, uh, oh my goodness. You won't believe what I'm looking for. September <laughs> of last year. Are you sure we had this meeting? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. Oh, history informs us so often. So often. Wow. All right, let's have the conflict of interest discussion. All right, thank you, sir. On pages 35 through 37, uh, this, is the, this will be new for Jessica. The board members have seen this before. This is an, an annual review of what can be perceived as a conflict of interest due to the fact that we manage both the RTA and the MTA. Uh, we go through and identify those items that, that would have a potential conflict. And, and then on the right-hand side is how, the, how it is mitigated. Um, I would like to highlight the fact that so on pages 36 is, is very normal things that happen on a year to year basis and, and are mitigated on page 37. We do have most of the same at the very bottom of, of page 37 is a new one for uh, the board's consi not consideration, but review. And that is mm. uh, the review of the uh, we go uh, ride pilot program, which we are about to review. And that will be the mitigation. We do review it with both boards. And I will get into more details when we get into that information item. Uh, last thing to highlight is the, two, the third and fourth one down on page 37, the proximity cards and commission of tickets. That will go away as we implement the new fare collection system. So those will not be on for next year because uh, it will all be under WeGo Public Transit and we won't have those items anymore. So other than that, unless there's questions, I think we've mitigated pretty much all of the potential conflict, well, not pretty much. We have mitigated all the conflicts of interest that could be perceived by the public, and, and I think we're in good shape. And I will open it for questions. And also reviewed this material with the RTA board last week. So Thank both you. boards basically get the same um, presentation. Uh, Ed, when you say that the revenue sharing for the We Go Ride pilot program yes, sir. Um, was reviewed uh, by both boards it will be reviewed in just a minute by this board uh we have reviewed it last the month other board is vanderbilt rta has also been reviewed rta's board rta's okay. board yes sir right. thank you thank you thank you so unless there's any other questions that concludes my report on the conflict of interest okay how about the uh ride pilot 
the uh, ride pilot true up. With yes, sir. That's what we were just talking about. And on pages 38 and 39, we do have this as a, as a background for the board. Uh, the board, both boards have approved this pilot program. It was basically related to the, what we used to call the easy ride program. Oh, yes. It had become very stagnant. Um, we asked the boards to give us some, uh, some latitude in terms of coming up with a new program that could, we could promote to businesses and universities. And with the board's approvals, we did do that. We did go reach out to businesses, talk about what they would like to see. It was an overwhelming response to keep it very simple to have one point of contact, to make it very understandable. And, and it's highlighted in the first part of this, what the, what the goals of this program will be. And I will not go back over those in detail, but that is pretty much the detail. I'm sorry, I have to, that is pretty much the detail of, of why, why the program was started. Um, when we did start this, uh, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And unfortunately, we did not have a lot of takers to this. It's more of an annual as opposed to a per swipe charge. We are taking an an, a total employee employee base and on a drastically discounted rate paying on an annual basis. The concept is that if we know that not everybody is going to use transit, so the people that the employer is paying for that don't use it will help supplement the people that do. Sure. So, and again, it's a pilot program. We're just wanting to see how it will work and we will continue to bring this back to the board until we decide if it is a viable program. So. The only, the only taker, if you will, the only participant was Vanderbilt University. They started in April of 2020. We decided not to do a true up at the end of, of June of 2020 due to the pandemic. We just didn't have a lot of, of activity. So we made this a 15 month review of what's been going on. And at the, t at the bottom of page 38, you see how the rates were done. It was done with Vanderbilt University. As you know, Vanderbilt University and the medical center split as two entities. Uh, the medical center is staying is on the purse white program and is still currently participating in that the Vanderbilt University chose to go to the new program. It was based on faculty, staff and students of 20,000. You can see that it's a very drastically discounted rate of $20 and 50 cents and that will become important here in just a second because that sounds like just unbelievably low. Um, so their, their annual their monthly payment is 34,166 based on that calculation. If you'll go to the pot, top of page 39. We have the analysis of what has occurred over the last 15 months. You can see we've done about 86,000 rides. The way we chose to allocate the, uh, which is what is important about this true up, is how the revenues um, under this program are allocated between RTA and MTA on an equitable, uh, transparent basis. We did take the full fares of all of both entities based on the number of rides, and we basically came up with a weighted average of how the, the, the collection of funds under this program would be allocated between MTA and RTA. And it makes sense because MTA, as you can see, has the bulk of the rides, but our, our fare is at a $2 rate. And where it makes it more fair for RTA is on a weighted basis, their fares are much higher, but they have fewer riders. So we felt that this was the most equitable way to, to uh, do this allocation. So you can see how the 512,000 over the 15 months was spread. What's important to note is the far right column of that, of that uh, analysis, and you can see what the cost per ride is. And the reason that is, is because of the pandemic. Um, prior, to the, prior to the pandemic, MTA was providing anywhere from 35 to 40,000 rides a month for Vanderbilt. And as you can see, we only did 72,000 in 15 months. And then again, that's due to the pandemic. We're very well aware of this. We've already had a meeting with Vanderbilt uh, to talk about it. Um, we know it's not fair, if you will, in terms of for Vanderbilt. Uh, so we are, going, we are uh, starting conversations with them about how we do make this more equitable, if you will, for Vanderbilt going forward until we see what the true recovery is for ridership. So the point of this whole analysis is basically for the board to see that it is an equitable way that that last paragraph, we, we do believe that the revenue sharing allocation methodology is fair, uh, but we do have some work to do because of the pandemic and awaiting to see how much will be recovered uh, in terms of ridership. So we're gonna come up with some different ideas that we will probably be sharing with the board. Steve will for sure through his report. Uh, but again, that, that's where this program came from. And I am happy to say that uh, we have started having more activity with smaller businesses. Uh, we will do another true up in June um, because we feel it's important for you to see that how it's working with other customers besides Vanderbilt. So. Um, unless there's questions that would conclude my report. 
I mean, Mr. We Chair, know that it's uh, the only things I would add to what Ed, Ed had to say was I'd amplify his last point. Uh, since Rick Rodriguez came on board, he's going gangbuster selling this. I, I signed another agreement yesterday. Uh, we've probably got now, I'm going to guess, 15 companies now signed up for this program, including your esteemed alma mater. Um, so we're pleased yep. to have Fisk on board. Yep. We did have a very productive meeting with Vanderbilt, and um, they are very committed to the program. They're very committed to transit use, transit service, trip reduction on campus. They need to do it as a business necessity. Uh, we kicked around several ideas, including potentially, um, certainly we'll adjust the contract rate for next year to reflect actual, be closer to actual usage. Uh, but even creative ideas like um, what I'll call root guarantees that um, trying to make some more direct service availability and how might they contribute to that piece. So um, had great discussion with them on that. And I think we'll have some really solid proposals to exchange. Well, I know it took every bit of his uh, strength to use equity and Vanderbilt in the same phrase. So, so we, we, we know that it, it will be an important 15-month analysis. Now, you also want to talk about the arm and car extension, if there are no further questions from the board, from the committee and the board. <laughs> All right, then. All let's, right. Let's hear about arm and car. On page 40, you have a, uh, it's, uh, th my last request is for an extension to the armored car services. As you know, just for background, uh, we collect fares on the fare boxes on the buses as they return to Nestor property. They're dumped from the fare box into a larger vault. Then we take that vault to a processing center through an armored car service so that we actually do not touch the cash. It just goes straight to the, to the service, which is a really good internal control, obviously. Um, with that said, a year ago, the board did approve this contract for a one-year extension due to issues we were having with the RFP at the time that was in progress due to a wide gap in rates that were proposed by the proposers at that time and due to COVID, I know I'm, we're ever, all tired of hearing that, due to COVID, we were really having a hard time getting timely responses uh, for that. So the board did approve a, a one-year contract extension and here we are again. Uh, I will say that we did go out to, for an RFP. Um, we changed it a little bit that US Bank was now willing to do the cash processing. So all we needed to do is have our vaults delivered. So we changed it a little bit. Um, we did send it out to whoever was available, and I'll get to that in just a second. The competition is very sparse, but we, we did uh, send it out and received two responses, one from Loomis, who is our current contractor, and another from Brinks, who we've dealt with in the past. Um, unfortunately, they both replied initially that they would not submit proposals. Uh, Brinks' reasons were that they did not have the equipment necessary to carry our vaults. Um, to, to make that transport, that transit to their facility. And then Loomis uh, was willing, but they also wanted to maintain the cash processing service because they didn't think it was worth their while to just do a vault delivery. So we're in a kind of a quandary. We we're obviously in a period of transition with COVID and everything else and ourselves as well. Uh, the, the market has definitely become less competitive in the last five years. Brinks has bought two of the other services that were originally vendors. <laughs> Um, so now there's only three vendors in the region. There's Loomis, there's Brinks, and there's Garda, Garda which I mean, you might see those trucks running around. But Garda, is, their primary services are for TVM services and maintenance of TVMs. So they really weren't going to, they did not reply to the, to the request. So Loomis, in the meantime, has agreed to do another one year up to a one year contract extension. They did ask for a 4% increase. They didn't have an increase in the contract that was extended for this year. So that was pretty, I thought, pretty reasonable. Um, so we're basically asking the board to approve a contract extension for up to one year, not to exceed $137,750, because we think at this point we need to do a full-blown assessment of how we do our cash handling services, um, especially tied in with our security. And uh, we just feel that we need the time, we need this to be a bridge for us to do that full-blown analysis to see what we need to do, because another consideration is with the new fare collection system, we should be receiving less cash. Um, we want everybody to go account-based and have less cash, so we might not have the same needs. On the other side of that, we have ticket vending machines that are going out, North Nashville being a perfect example, where there might need to be cash collection in those ticket vending machines. So we've, we've got a lot of moving parts right now, so we're asking the board to consider this extension for one year so we can do this assessment and figure out what direction we're going. Great. Um. 
Any comments regarding uh, this action item? Uh, if not, we'll recommend, the committee will recommend it to the board for its approval. That concludes my report, sir. Thank you. There's a recommendation from the committee not requiring a second. Um, is there any further discussion? Any questions? No further dis uh, questions or comments. I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you very much. All right. We will now hear from uh, our chief operating officer, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Chair. Regarding monthly operating. If you turn to um, pages 41 through 45 for the operation statistics for the month of November, um, as you guys know, um, October we had our service changes that restored a great deal of amount of service for us. Um, I do want to highlight um, that we did add a, a row for pre-pandemic comparisons. Uh, so November of 2021, we were performing about 65% of our pre-pandemic uh, ridership. Uh, compared, comparatively to last year, we were only doing about 44%. So we are seeing that growth kind of taking place, which is great. Um, over the last month or so, with these service changes, we have seen an improved improvement in missed trips. Um, and as you know, in October, with new operators taking different routes, uh, there, there's a, a, an adjustment period that needs to take place. So our missed trips and uh, on-time performance and all that has kind of uh, started rebuilding. I'm happy to report that on-time performance is also holding strong with traffic conditions continuing to pick back up. Um, one thing to note, um, and this will be kind of discussed uh, further in the meeting, in recent weeks, um, you know, with the Omicron virus, uh, some of our attendance and absences has gone up, but fortunately we've been able to uh, continue growing our manpower over, I'm sorry, our headcounts over the last few months uh, in preparation for spring service changes. So um, but we are keeping an eye on that um, as we continue to kind of move forward. And uh, if there are no questions, that'll complete my report. Any additional queries? None for me, thank you. All right. All right. Andy, thank you. Um, let's see. I'm trying to discover where I be. Uh, Mr. Olden is going to give us a safety management systems plan update, an SMS update. Um, and there he is. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Committee Chair Searcy, um, Madam Chair, and our other distinguished uh, members of the board for this opportunity to kind of tell you what safety has been up to for the last year and a half, specifically as it relates to uh, the safety management system. <clears throat> so uh, this is behind you, although this is behind you, um, this is our, our performance targets. If you can all remember, uh, we adopted the FTA standard for agency safety plan and implemented that in 2020, uh, which is just an overall plan to make sure that our employees, our contractors, our riders, and the general public stay safe in our system. Uh, the FTA requires us under that safety plan to establish safety performance targets to address the safety performance measures identified in the National uh, Transportation Safety Plan. The data that you're looking at um, is, is the data that we report to the FTA as part of that agency safety plan. And these are our 2020 safety performance targets as reported to the National uh, Transit Database. I won't go through all of the, uh, the numbers uh, simply because like where, where you see per 100,000 VRM, this is just a formula that the FTA gives us to report the same data in a different format. So um, if you look at uh, the fatalities on the bus side, uh, we did have, of course, our target is always going to be zero fatalities, but we did have one fatality on the bus side, uh, none on the, on the access ride side. Uh, our injuries on the, on the bus side um, are under our target, which is good, and, and also an access ride, we came under. Uh, safety events. Uh, that's anything, a collision, a derailment, a hazardous material spill, act of nature, evacuation, anything that would cause someone to be transported away from the scene or property damage equaling to or exceeding $25,000. Uh, so on the bus side, 
Uh, we did go over, um, uh, we didn't quite hit our target. We went two over our target, uh, but on access ride side, we did come under our target. And then system reliability, that's simply just miles between major mechanical failures that prevent our bus or our van from completing its revenue trip. Uh, so our target was to go 5,500 miles with, you know, without a major breakdown, uh, we were able to go 4,930, so we're close. Uh, and then on the access ride side, our target was 24,800 miles. We came in uh, under that at 19,199. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a 30,000 uh, viewpoint, a 30,000 feet viewpoint. So I kind of want to take us in more specifically to the safety management system, uh, affectionately known as the SMS. And as with anything, we need a working definition so that we stay on the same page. Uh, so on the screen now is the definition of what a SMS is. It's a formal, top-down, organization-wide approach to managing safety risks and assuring that we're mitigating those risks down to an acceptable level. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's basically, that's, that's the formal definition, but really it's how do we assess hazards and then mitigate them down so that we prevent the accident from happening and not just waiting for the accident to happen. Uh, don't know if you've seen the, the movie Minority Report uh, with Tom Cruise, uh, but typically officers arrive at a crime scene after the crime has been committed. Well, in this movie, Tom Cruise's character, he's over the pre-crime department, and their whole job is to analyze people and, you know, try to, and they go and arrest the person before they even commit the crime. That's, that's what the SMS is. We're trying to prevent the crime from happening. I mean, prevent the accident from happening and crime too. <laughs> so the Good FTA, luck. thank you. Uh, so the FTA says that there are, uh, there are keys to this successful SMS. Uh, so if you look up at the top, um, uh, they call these the four SMS components. Uh, safety management policy, which we, uh, you all adopted in 2020 as well, is basically just to establish senior management's commitment to continually improve safety. Uh, then if you go over to the right, there's the safety risk management, and this is just to determine the needs for new or revised uh, risk controls. Safety assurance evaluates the continued effort of those, uh, of those controls to make sure that they're actually working. And then safety promotion includes training, communication, any other action uh, to make sure that we're promoting a positive safety culture within our organization. And so now I kind of want to zoom in. We started at the safety plan level. We zoomed into a uh, safety management system. And now I want to zoom in further to highlight our efforts in safety risk management and safety assurance to kind of show how they're key components of a successful SMS. So here on the screen, uh, we start with safety hazard identification. This is safety risk management. So we start with safety hazard identification. How do we get hazards in or, or concerns in? Um, once we get those in, then what do we do with them? Drop down to safety risk assessment. We determine what to do with those hazards. First, we need to determine the priority of them. Uh, we get five hazards in, which is the most probable to cause an accident? That's the one that goes highest on the priority list, and we begin to mitigate that down. You go over to the right, safety risk mitigation. That's once we've identified and prioritized those hazards, now let's start, how do we avoid that hazard or segregate it down uh, to an acceptable level and make sure that we're not creating new hazards in the process. And then if you go up, monitor and measure, it's just making sure that anything that we've implemented, is it working? And if it's not, we go back to the safety hazard and start that closed system all over again. So what we noticed was the, the way that we get those hazards in uh, primarily comes either through our employees or complaints uh, from, from passengers or our own analysis of safety data. So in doing uh, some initial analysis when I first came on board, something really glared and jumped out at me. It was fixed object accidents. Those are accidents where our operators are hitting something that's stationary. They're hitting signs, poles, uh, columns, and it's like, what are we doing here? You know, that was, it, it, it kind of jumped off the pages at me. And so in looking at the data, it started to seem like, you know, most of our, some of our new operators were the ones heavily involved in these accidents. And so the SMS says, all right, once you have that, start asking certain questions. So the next question was, where are we having these accidents? So if you look at the, uh, the chart on the screen, 
um, out of 62 fixed object accidents, 51% of them happen at our central, uh, our central hub at downtown. It's like, wow. Okay. More specifically, they're happening in the area of the downtown hub where the buses go around this nice little curve to exit. So we call it the horseshoe because it looks like horseshoe, but um, it, it's kind of like they come in, pick up passengers or, or, or board passengers, and then they go around this little curve to exit. That's where the majority of them are happening. And so it's like, okay. All right, so I, we got new operators that are having some of these. Uh, they're happening in a certain part of our hub. So the SMS said, all right, now we got to mitigate that down. So we went to training and said, maybe we need to beef up training on some of our new operators. So we extended training by a week. And in that week, we said, take those new operators specifically in that horseshoe, in that area, so many times that they could drive it with their eyes. Well, I, I won't say with their eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I want uh, operators yeah. driving with their eyes closed, but get the point. So, so many times that they're, they're super comfortable with it, uh, but also we want to work with our engineering and facilities team to see if there's any possible structural changes uh, that, that we can do. So uh, here on, on this screen, if you look down here, um, the bottom left corner, the bottom left picture, this is before mitigation. So you can see that's the horseshoe that we're talking about. So you can see in that barrier there, only the tip of the barrier has high visibility paint. And you also see up here, uh, the top left corner uh, picture, the columns there, those are the columns that most of the operators were hitting. Those columns are the same color as the wall. And so we brought in our, our experts, our facilities experts and our, and our engineering experts. And they said, you know what? what's probably happening is most of those operators are having their depth of, of, of field perception is off because the, the column is the same color as the wall. Um, and so, you know, this was important because, you know, we, we, it's important to bring experts in because we're gonna build a bunch of these transit centers in the future. And, you know, we wanna make sure that it's not happening, the same design problems are not happening in those future centers. So if we can identify them, we can design them out in future, uh, in future design plans. Uh, because, you know, me, I'm thinking, we, we all met down there and I'm like, hey, just take the columns out or, you know, take the, take the barrier out. They're like, Nick, those are low bearing columns. Like you can't, <laughs> can't just take them out, you know? Uh, so we, we, we came up with over here on the right side. Uh oh, sorry, let me go back. On the right side, that's after mitigation. So they said, let's take the most, the least intrusive uh, approach first. Yeah, we could cut the barrier back some, but let's put high visibility paint. So you see over in the, in the right picture, there's high visibility paint now around the entire horseshoe. And then we also put, they also put high visibility paint on those columns so that their depth of field, uh, depth perception is, is, is better. And, and so all of that leads up to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the climax is this, this next slide. Out of 62 fixed object accidents at Central, that happened in 2020, after we mitigated those, in 2021, we only had seven of those accidents. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take pictures, I'll take pictures later. Oh. But, uh, you know, it's, it's over 85% reduction in fixed object accidents at Central simply because we used the SMS approach. Um, and so lastly, uh, this is the last slide. What are our next steps uh, for safety? We really want to kind of focus in on causal analysis. It's easy when an accident happens to blame the operator, discipline the operator and move on. But uh, a lot of these other factors need to, need to be uh, looked at so that we can kind of look at the system in totality to make sure that we're designing out any hazards, that we're removing any hazards. Uh, for example, like uh, equipment and infrastructure factors. Is it a design failure? Or is it scheduling failure? Are time points too far apart or too close together? Um, and environmental factors, is it insufficient lighting in certain places? Uh, is it because of poor weather? Uh, and then there are outside factors, factors that we can't simply, simply can't control. So we begin to look at all of those together instead of just blaming the operator. And then lastly, uh, we want to continue to expand our list of, of subject matter experts. Um, as we get hazards in, 
Uh, the reason we were able to mitigate that at Central, because we called the experts in from our own engineering and facilities team. But we want to keep expanding that list so that when we get new hazards in, uh, we have a list of people we can call to help us kind of mitigate those down. Uh, that is my time, uh, board members, and I feel like I've been before you way too long, uh, so I'll open it up to any questions if you have any. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, that, I'm assuming that's just one um, example, but they're, you're utilizing that SMS for, uh, you know, system-wide, right? Absolutely. The, the thing I would add on is, um, first of all, real credit to Nick. Um, while we had him take on the SMS responsibilities, which were daunting in their own respect, he is also, I don't, this will come across the wrong way, but he's also been Mr. Cook uh, for WeGo. So he has uh, worked very closely with Metro Public Health on our mitigation strategies and implementing a whole bunch of things. I had to learn a new way to walk into buildings with these new mats that you you got to walk in properly or a whole bunch of bad things can happen if I step wrong. Um, so really taking on all of that. And uh, my intent would be to have him report to you periodically on similar types of, um, frankly, when he started walking through this with me, I'm like, you know, we only have an hour and a half uh, with these folks. So uh, maybe we'll do a little bit more frequently and touch on, you know, in addition to the overall trends, which is important, um, some of the specific initiatives. He's getting tremendous buy-in from our um, operators, our operating employees, our union folks, uh, because he's very participatory in nature. And the thing I would say that's really different about this approach and why the FTA came out with it historically, and Nick alluded to it, the approach in bus safety, more so than on the rail side, was accident happens, you figure out what happened, it was either preventable or it wasn't. If it wasn't, if it wasn't preventable, you moved on. If it was preventable, in his words, you blame the operator, you retrain the operator, and you did that. On the rail side, historically, it's been much more, those, are, those tend to be catastrophic accidents when they happen. So there's a lot more effort into the system side and identifying the risks and mitigating the risk. And that's what we're trying to migrate over to the bus side of the operation. And I think over time, you'll see a lot of direct impact on our overall accident numbers. So Nick, this was your first time presenting, correct? In front of us? Well, well done. Well done. You and Mary, I tell you, I'm knocking it out of the ballpark today. This is awesome. I think, I think Nick and I are going to hit the road. I think so. What do you say, Nick? Let's, I could listen to you read the phone book, which I know doesn't exist anymore. You know, but, we're looking for ongoing entertainment at the North Nashville Transit Center. I so. know. Maybe you can be announcer. Well done, though. Thank you very much. It was very informative. Thank you. Well, with that note of endorsement, we will um, go to the uh, list, take a list at the upcoming procurement projects. And uh, I just ask each and every one of us to uh, try to assist Rita and the gang uh, on recommending uh, contractors that we know of and have worked with or experienced they're working directly uh, to expand their list of, of uh, minority and women um, and uh, in minorities and women, including uh, certainly uh, LGBTQ uh, providers as well. Uh, without that, uh, operations and finance has done its deal. Well, Mr. Searcy, job well done today. Thank you very much. Uh, good job. Good work done here today. Uh, Mary, I'm going to turn back over to you for a more nice committee. Okay, if everybody can turn to page 49, Felix Castrada is going to uh, give us a report. Good afternoon. Good to see you all. Morning, afternoon, evening almost, Felix. <laughs> half, half feels better to be in this position. Um, I, uh, so I'm here to uh, talk to you and give you an update on the proposed changes for the spring. I will apologize in advance. I don't have any uh, example with a Tom Cruise movie. Uh, I, thought about <laughs> Keanu, I thought about Keanu Reeves and, and, and uh, Speed, but if you saw the movie, that's probably not a good idea. So, oh, but it was so good. Uh, <laughs> I'll stay away from that. Um, 
I have uh, some slides for you, um, so I'll go through these. Um, so I just want to give you, first of all, remind you about some of the underlying challenges that we have, to, have been experiencing as we put, uh, implement these uh, changes over the past several months. Before the COVID pandemic has been the, uh, the main thing. And um, last year, when we talked to you about the next service changes, uh, we had two particular challenges that we were experiencing, uh, the bus operator shortage, a vehicle shortage with the supply chain uh, issues. Well, uh, the good thing is uh, you, you heard uh, Andy talking about how we've been taking some steps and we're uh, putting in position to be able to uh, put this service forward. And, uh, and again, we continue to monitor everything as it happens. Um, also, the principles that guide these service changes, we try to be equitable in everything that we do. Uh, and of course, we want to make sure that the improvements that we make are gonna be uh, helping the majority of the riders we also have to keep in mind um, the rest of the network, and make sure that we balance the resources that we have and uh, stay also nimble and flexible. Things change very quickly. Uh, this slide is basically a summary of the changes that were approved. Uh, we talked about last year, as you remember, the direction was to utilize some of the federal funding from the American Rescue Plan to be able to start implementation of better bus. And we've been putting a lot of emphasis on improving the frequency on those major corridors, uh, extending the, the uh, span of the hours of operations, uh, especially for uh, those major corridors as well. Uh, we're moving now with that same approach for some of the local routes, including weekends, evenings as well. We're uh, looking at some route modification related to transit centers, uh, as well as new routes to help people um, move without having to go to downtown. And in the regional uh, um, sphere, we're also trying, uh, we're gonna go back to the uh, pre-pandemic level of service hours, the RTA routes. Um, just a reminder that uh, this is the change route extension of uh, Route 17, 12 Avenue South. We're extending this from the, uh, the current end of the line, which is Lipscomb University, to connect to the new Hillsborough Transit Center. Uh, the center will be uh, open and operational uh, by the time these changes take effect. Uh, and that also will provide a connection to Route 7, uh, Hillsborough. We're, we're excited to see these uh, uh, Also, some additional changes that we talked about, the new connector route, uh, 79 Skyline, connecting Dickerson Pike and Gallatin Pike. Um, and also, capping, which is related to, uh, to Queen's Ticket, which is the, our new uh, fur payment platform. Uh, so this is kind of an equity uh, uh, initiative for us. Uh, we approved the daily fair capping a while back, and last month the board approved the monthly fair capping. So this is going to be, be providing some, expanding those options or some of those discounts to uh, all the riders that previously were not accessible to them. Um, in terms of what we have uh, for the spring, uh, since the last time we talked about service changes, we've, we've been doing some additional improvements. Nothing that raises to the level of a major change, but we want to make sure that you keep you uh, informed of what we are doing. Uh, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but also we'll be doing some reassignment of the base at Central to make sure that uh, there's a better flow and improve the safety there. Uh, in terms of the proposed frequency and span changes for the spring, uh, we're going to be increasing the frequency on weekday for uh, in service for the day. Uh, we're going to also provide a better frequency for this route during Saturdays with 40 minutes daytime. And for days, we're going to be operating every 15 minutes. We're also doing some renumbering of routes um, just to make sure that we make this and communicate this easier to the riders. Um, route 3 and 5, they operate for the most part in the same corridor, which is West End. They just, uh, Route 3 continues currently on, uh, up north on White Bridge, and then Route 5 continues south uh, up there to, toward Bellevue. It'll be now Route uh, 3, with 3A being the, the branch that goes to uh, White Bridge, and 3B being the one that continues to Bellevue. Uh, same is the case for Route 22, Bordeaux, where uh, the long-term care uh, branch will be 22A down County Hospital Road, that 22B will be served in the Young's Lane, King's Lane area. We also uh, want to make some changes in terms of the number of uh, some routes, uh, just to emphasize the connector nature of those routes. Uh, we're combining Route 21, Wedgwood, and 77, uh, Thompson. It'll become Route 77, Wedgwood, Thompson, 
and Route 25 will be they consistent with the connector numbering. We have a small modification for Route 4. Um, this is for uh, the section on Gallatin Pike turning onto RD Avenue. Uh, this is just some operational constraints that we're having with making the turn there. We don't really have a lot of boardings there, and we work with a council member, uh, council member Benedict of District 7 on this change. So the, ra the, the route will now be taking uh, Route 4 and Kennedy to continue to uh, and uh, we're excited about Route 79, a new connector route. Uh, I mentioned that it's going to be connecting uh, Gallatin Pike and uh, Dickerson Pike. So uh, the main change we have since we last talked is that originally we had conceived this as Route 79 being a separate bus. So uh, now that what we're proposing to do is to have Route 76 turn into Route 79. So we'll be utilizing the same bus rather than having uh, which is the Madison Station, that's where the Madison Library is. So if somebody's riding the Madison Connector, which is Route 76, what they get to Madison Station, if they want to continue to Dickerson Park, they don't have to transfer buses, they just stay on the same bus, and that bus becomes Route 79 and continues to Dickerson Park. Uh, so we've changed a little bit of the routing, but we still got to start with the uh, generators uh, along the route um, with the United Neighborhood Health. Uh, also into the Dickerson Walmart, and that's a connection to Route 23, Dickerson, and also then going across uh, Dickerson to Skyland Hospital. And also, we're going to be servicing Dickerson Pike uh, north of there, uh, including Buffalo Trail Apartment, which is one of the locations where some of the Afghan refugees have been relocated to. So we're excited to be able to provide that service uh, coming up. Uh, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, this is the combination of Route 21 and 77. They both, both converge at They both, both converge at the Hundred Oaks area, so basically just to make it simpler, uh, it'll be just one route and nobody, uh, riders don't have to change buses out there. The other change related to that is we are proposing to extend this route north. Uh, right now, the, at the end of the line is TSU. Um, we are proposing to extend this north via Ed Temple Boulevard to connect to 26 uh, Avenue and, and Clarksville, which is the site of the North Nashville Transit Center where we've talked about at length today. So this is an operational change in anticipation of the opening of the center in 2023. And just a reminder that we still uh, are under the uh, public comment period that closes next week. Uh, these are some of the ways that the public can comment, either writing or uh, the website, email. They can call, they can comment on social media. So we've been tracking all of those comments. Uh, next steps, uh, public comment closes next week. We've had three public meetings uh, already. Uh, then after that, we're going to be assessing the public comments. We're going to be doing equity analysis in February and bringing any final recommendations to the board in, uh, at the February board meeting, and changes will go into effect on April 3rd. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, this is an update. We'll be bringing this back to you in February, but I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The new route? So traveling west from Gallatin Pike, it, it gets on uh, due west, Briarville. It takes a little bit of Briarley and then um, just connects to uh, Dickerson Pike once it gets uh, there and then directly to the Walmart. It's exciting. It, it is. Really quick question as well. Why do we change the name like from the 5 to a 3A or I'm a little confused like just... Well, we have two separate routes that operate basically on the same corridor. Uh, we're just trying to be more consistent in the way we, uh, we have the, the routes. This is going to be a, a, a major corridor route. So instead of having two routes that do kind of a different things but operate for most of the, the same corridor, we're just wanting to make sure that those two uh, we communicate that sometimes it's a little difficult because they, people cannot distinguish that they can take either the five or the three if they're traveling within uh, one section of the corridor. Uh, this way it's just one route. You just need to know whether, where the 3A goes and where the 3B goes. Um, and, and I think it, we found out it's a little easier to make that communication to the public. I think that's, I think that's wonderful. I think we also kind of serve as ambassadors and people, I don't know, they ask me questions about, you know, like those are the kinds of questions the public would ask, would ask us. And so I appreciate you explaining that because that makes perfect sense. Thank you.
All right. Good. Um, I can get us kicked, uh, kicked off for the next uh, item, which is the better boss. That, that would be great. And if All right. Dan needs to jump in, go ahead and, and you All right. guys do that. Uh, Justin, our senior transit planner, is going to be making the, the uh, bulk of that presentation. I just want to uh, mention that, um, as, I, as I talked about earlier, the direction when uh, we presented our budget to Metro. We got we got uh, all the funding that we asked, but uh, not the, the better bus tier. So we decided to move forward with the uh, federal funding that we got through the uh, American Rescue Plan, um, and that took us in the direction that we were going, trying to start implementation of better bus, which is a five-year plan. Um, but as we prepare for the uh, next budget, we're going to continue to bring these uh, uh, to Metro um, with some of the. Uh, items that we wanted to continue to implement as part of the Better Bows. Uh, so with that, Justin is going to come here as he's going to talk us uh, through the, what that looks for our uh, fiscal year 23 budget request. Good afternoon. Um, so like Felix said, I'm just going to give a kind of a quick update on the Better Bus uh, project. Again, that's our five-year plan for trying to improve the bus system. Uh, you know, an early recommendation from in motion. Key goals, basically, you know, making the system, you know, easier to use, uh, promoting, you know, more spontaneous use, creating a, a network that people can use throughout the week, and trying to reduce people's travel times. Uh, so with those goals, we had identified a series of specific improvements and kind of worked out a plan for phasing those in over about five years. Now, of course, the pandemic has had a huge impact on uh, the project. Uh, the, the first uh, you know, impact that I'll highlight is that you know, some of the ridership patterns that we were seeing during the pandemic actually really kind of confirmed and elevated some of those better bus priorities. Uh, so uh, first off, you know, we were seeing much less of what uh, us planners call uh, a peak in ridership. Uh, essentially, you know, we were not seeing nearly as much ridership from sort of the, the standard nine to five commuter um, pattern. Uh, meanwhile, we were continuing to see a lot of, of riders uh, accessing service jobs, uh, accessing other you know, essential services, and, and those trips were happening throughout the day and throughout the week. So we didn't see quite as much of a, a peak in ridership demand uh, during the AM rush hour or the PM rush hour. Uh, similarly, you know, the ridership impacts that we were seeing were not distributed evenly across our system. So some corridors were more impacted than others. Um, so based on that, you know, over the past couple of years, we have shifted resources around, reallocating resources from some of the commuter routes and connector routes to some of the areas where we were seeing that higher demand. Um, the other thing I'll highlight, like Felix said, uh, is that through the American Rescue Plan, we've been able to use that uh, to, to sort of uh, seed fund some of the other Better Bus, better bus um, priorities. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what that has meant. Um, so, so this, this chart kind of shows you where we're at, essentially. So the, the, the main thing I'll highlight here is that, you know, in addition to being able to advance some of those early phases of Better Bus, we've also actually made quite a bit of progress on some of the things that we had originally slated for later in the plan. Um, and, and that really uh, gets at, you know, expanding the frequent service, uh, particularly on the Dickerson Pike corridor, uh, but also uh, adding more of the evening and weekend service uh, throughout the system. Um, so as we look ahead to the next fiscal year, we're uh, starting to identify our priorities for what we want to invest in next. Um, you know, so the, at a high level, the first thing we want to do is kind of continue to meet that demand that we've seen, uh, really only confirmed through the pandemic for kind of a, a network that people can use all day, all week, not just during rush hour. Uh, we also want to respond to some of the customer requests that we've received for uh, improved frequency and particularly better crosstown connections. Uh, so last summer, when we were uh, engaging the public around some of our uh, planned changes for fall and now next spring, uh, we asked people what they wanted to see next. And these were kind of the top two priorities for riders. Uh, the next thing is we want to begin service improvements uh, to support the North Nashville Transit Center. Uh, so you guys have heard a lot about that today. Uh, and, you know, it's really only a couple of service changes away before we're, we'll be opening that facility. So we're already starting to look at what are the best ways we can start to invest in service so that that facility can be as useful as possible from day one. 
And then lastly, you know, looking at expanding Wego Link, which uh, Felix and Dan will talk about in a, little, a little bit more detail later, uh, but using that to serve some of the lower demand areas. So I'll get into a little bit more detail here. Um, you know, one of the really you know, exciting things that we've been able to do already is extend our service hours to past midnight on our top nine corridors. Uh, so one thing that we're looking at doing next year is continue the, that span improvement, uh, get service going after 1 a.m. Uh, and then also, um, you know, ex extending span on some of our local routes as well. Uh, and then access service that would, uh, the span there would extend uh, to match the fixed route. And then also our access on demand. Uh, it's been a very popular program. Uh, we're extending service later now. Uh, we want to also extend that to the weekends as well. Uh, we're looking at some other frequent and local service improvements. Uh, frequency improvements, uh, both Route 7 Hillsboro and 8 8th Avenue targeting some midday service improvements for those routes. Uh, and then I mentioned North Nashville Transit Center, uh, looking at uh, crosstown service improvements uh, to really help uh, reduce travel times, uh, and that will tie in really nicely with that facility. We're also looking at a, a strategic route extension for the 52A, uh, and then you know this is something that we think will work well in coordination with expansion of WeGo Link uh, that, again, Dan and Felix will talk about a little bit more later. So uh, what that looks like overall is uh, about 42,000 annual revenue hours, um, and that will be uh, a cost of about five and a half million in, in um, annual operating. Of course, this is uh, you know on top of sort of our baseline, which, uh, as Felix explained you know earlier, uh, will will still need to be uh, funded uh, this year by Metro. So overall, that's about an eight percent increase in service, and you can kind of see how that's split. Uh, between the different, uh, you know, main areas of, of the, the plan. And then, uh, you know, as, as we've seen this year, uh, we think it's uh, wise to sort of phase that in over the two service changes uh, through the fiscal year uh, so that we can continue to ramp up both operators and fleet availability. But you can see there's a, a relatively modest impact on fleet uh, requirement uh, and then you know again uh, operators will be needed to, to operate this additional service so so this chart gives you a, a picture of where we would be after fiscal year 23 again making uh, you know much more progress um, on the span and the evening and weekend service uh, and then also starting to make some of those investments in local and connector routes and, and crosstown service uh, to reduce travel times Then looking ahead beyond fiscal year 23 for uh, fiscal year 24, we would uh, be targeting, again, additional service improvements associated with the North Nashville Transit Center, uh, since that's when we expect that facility to, op facility to open. Um, and, and that would include the Trinity Lane Crosstown route. That'll be a really valuable connection uh, associated with the, the Transit Center there. Uh, then we also want to continue to look at uh, the demand for commuter services and look at ways we can bring back that service uh, in a, in a cost-effective way. So, you know, p potentially adding uh, stops and trips on RTA service uh, that can really uh, serve uh, to improve that service and also provide uh, new locations for commuters to access it uh, within Davidson County. And then, uh, you know, additional expansion of the frequent network and, and more of those local and connector route improvements. Uh, so that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Is there, are there any questions? Great job. Thank you. Right. Well Thank done. You. I think this will be our discussion about WeGo Link. Is that right? Okay. Page, six, page 51. This is our last item. All right, thank you. I know we're getting a little late in the afternoon, so I'll try to be brief. Also, you actually saw most of my part of this uh, presentation before it was interrupted last month, so uh, we can breeze through this. Um, so we're talking about uh, the WeGoLink program. It's current. Uh, it was operating in pilot until, uh, or it's still it's still in the pilot, but we've officially launched it to the public as of October with those service changes. And this uh, is a first and last mile program that's operating in the southeast area of Davidson County in the Antioch neighborhood. Uh, the service is provided by Uber and one of our paratransit contractors, Mobility Solutions, who provides trips for customers that may not have access to a smartphone or prefer to pay with cash. 
um, and they can uh, book by just calling a phone number. Uh, all of the trips uh, do need to start or end at one of the two transfer locations uh, shown on this map, uh, but as long as the trip uh, starts and ends within the zone, uh, there's a subsidy applied to the trip so that most uh, trips only cost the customer about $2. Uh, and the cost to the agency uh, in terms of the, the subsidy to the provider uh, is uh, actually pretty similar to what our pre-pandemic subsidy per passenger was on our fixed route service system overall and actually quite a bit lower than it is now with, uh, with lower ridership during the pandemic. Um, and is actually significantly lower than, than what that uh, subsidy or, or cost per trip would have been on one of some of our lower performing routes that may otherwise be operating service in a lower density area like this. So as an example, the Route uh, 73 Bell Road connector before it was discontinued had a subsidy per passenger trip of about $35 per customer as opposed to this service, which is just over $6 per customer. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the zone identification criteria, that how, how we go about trying to figure out where this type of a service is going to be successful. Um, and again, you heard a little bit of this before, so I'll be brief, but essentially we look at areas uh, where we have connections to uh, existing high frequency transit, areas where we can make safe transfers that are accessible to all customers. And we wanna make sure we don't compete with ourselves. So we don't wanna just layer this service on top of an area where we already have robust fixed route service. And we also want to promote uh, demographic and geographic service equity. So we look at areas where we have customers that uh, have a need for the service. We look at lower income areas, uh, areas with uh, higher density of uh, minority populations, higher um, employment density as well, where we can connect to jobs. And then also making sure that we're expanding the, the overall geographic coverage of the network. And this map provides uh, an overview of some of the concept zones uh, that were laid out uh, in within Better Bus. And again, these are just general areas. These are being refined as we as we look further into the details about how each of these uh, services service zones may operate. But I wanted to uh, turn it over to uh, Felix to talk a little bit more about this and about how um, this uh, this program as a whole fits into the service improvements that uh, Felix and Justin have reviewed earlier in the overall uh, Better Bus Service Improvement Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, so if you recall during the, uh, if you were here at the time, during the motion plan process, we talked about mobility on demand areas as a way to improve access to transit. Um, and with Better Bus, we conceptualize a little bit of that. As Dan mentioned, these are general areas, but in, uh, Basically, they are uh, lower density areas on the outskirts where we currently don't provide coverage with our fixed route network. Uh, so in, in looking at ways to try to expand that, we, we kind of uh, look into what those uh, uh, are, but, uh, but also they, they pretty much meet the criteria that Dan talked about in the previous slide. But one thing that is important to remember, and Dan talked about this, this could be a, a more cost-effective approach to be able to not only provide coverage in new areas, but also areas where we had service before, but the service was not doing very well. It was uh, uh, underperforming. Um, this slide, I know it's, it's a little hard to see. Monica's gonna uh, forward the slides to you so you can look in more detail later. Uh, but basically, uh, what Using some of the census data, we identified what we call uh, uh, areas of uh, transit propensity. Um, these are areas that are, you know, where because of some of the demographics and some characteristics and some of the things that we looked at uh, include uh, zero car households, minority population, low income population, and uh, employment density. So we mapped that and we overlaid our uh, transit network on top of that. And immediately you can see some areas that are outside of our network that pop out as target, uh, potential target areas uh, where we have some transit propensity and currently we don't have um, any service there. Uh, also, recent data uh, trends that we've observed, and I'm sure the 2020 census data is gonna confirm this, is that we're seeing some of those more uh, transit dependent populations uh, being moved, uh, moving out, farther out into the county, especially to areas where we don't currently have service. Uh, and and this, is, this is important for us to be intentional about it because we have to acknowledge these and, and try to think about ways that we can uh, start deploying services that are gonna uh, help these more uh, vulnerable populations. Um, 
So mobility on demand uh, requires safe connection between the services, fixed route, and and the mobility and the you know the zones where uh, we operate mobility on demand. Uh, so we have to be able to have areas where uh, we can have uh, transfer that uh, meet ADA requirements and all that. So this chart just shows some of the uh, potential areas or tra potential transfer locations in each of these zones. Um, some are going to be easier to implement than others, but uh, definitely we want to make sure that all of these are suitable uh, to make those transfers happen. Um, also, uh, I, I think this is important because we have been talking about transit centers, but transit centers play, play a, a role in, in, in uh, accommodating this type of activity because they have spaces that are specifically designed for that type of, of activity. Uh, and then, you know, looking forward where we go from here, uh, these are some potential next steps that uh, we can uh, look at in, in leading to a budget request as part of a better bus tier in the future from learning from what we have uh, currently on the pilot, uh, make it better, and, you know, to coordination with the stakeholders, including council members, on ident identification of an establishment of potential new zones. Uh, so that's uh, my last slide, and uh, Dan and I will be happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Is it, does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a comment. I'm, I'm glad to see the potential expansion of the program, right? How is the program, current program going in, in terms of users and utilization? So current utilization has been fairly limited. We're seeing a handful of trips a day. Um, and, and just a few uh, regular users of the program. And we think there's, you know, there's a number of factors uh, for that, including the pandemic. But also, to be honest, we haven't done a lot of aggressive marketing because we wanted to make sure that the program rolled out smoothly. And so we're looking at uh, future efforts, you know, including potentially direct mailers and other strategic sort of, um, you know, getting, getting the word out essentially. Uh, we do have signage at the bus stops, but there's more we think we can do to increase awareness about the program. Um, but overall, uh, the, the, we haven't had any uh, issues or complaints from customers. And the, for the vast majority, I think there was maybe one or perhaps two trips where that cost for, to the customer was over $2. And those were just trips that were just a, a very, you know, about as long as you could take within, within that zone. So most customers are just paying that $2. Thank you. Thanks. The only thing I'd add to Dan's comments is even in the systems that have had this type of a program for quite some time, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of ridership. So it really is more of a coverage piece than it is an expectation that there'll be a huge you know, ridership gain out of it. Thank you. Madam Chair, that concludes the nice committee meeting. Thank you, Mary. A lot of work today. Thank you very much. You and Mr. Searcy both. I'll turn it over to you, Steve, for your report. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, on the one hand, I will try to, to make this quick because I know we're short on time. On the other hand, I got kicked out last month uh, before my report. Um, <laughs> so I have a lot of material to cover. Um, <laughs> first of all, what'd you say, Mayor? <laughs> so some people do anything not to have me report. Uh, so I wasn't I here last month, and I'm still confused what happened. So, <laughs> um, like the rest of the world, we continue to ride the COVID wave, and particularly the Omicron. Uh, as recently as about November, we had on average maybe five to seven employees who were off on COVID leave at any given time. With the recent ramp up, we've been in the 25 to 30 range. Um, so again, we're hopeful that some of the early signs that maybe it's starting to abate in Davidson County continue. In the meantime, we knock on wood. Also, though, to echo on some of the comments Andy made during his report, um, because of really aggressive work on the part of our HR department, our training department, our operations department, onlining new operators, um, and Nick's work in trying to mitigate our risks with COVID. Unlike most of the transit agencies in the country, you can see headline after headline of people who are actually having to cut service on a day-to-day -day basis because they just don't have enough people. We have had very reliable service in that regard. So we have not yet, knock on wood, um, had any disruptions um, you know, due to COVID. Uh, unfortunately, we had a little less uh, luck with our winter weather the last couple weeks. Mm. Um, as an alumnus of upstate New York, it always chaps me um, you know, when two inches of snow manages to, to shut down the city. 
but we certainly certainly had our challenges. And the one thing I'd remind folks of is even, even when some of our routes are maybe treacherous or, or uh, tough to get to, we're also uh, dealing with a lot of our operators live in very rural areas, some as far as Kentucky. So in addition to just buses getting around, um, just getting employees in and out of work safely um, is tough. But I have to give kudos to Andy's staff in operations, um, Trey and Patrick's staff in facilities. I was working out of Central the days of the snow, and I swear you could have you could have played street hockey on the sidewalks outside Central. They were clearer than any street uh, in Nashville. So kudos to our custodial staff and to our operations staff who literally worked around the clock to maximize the amount of service uh, that we had available. I'm not going to say anything about North Nashville Transit Center. You've heard enough. Um, I will echo a couple things on Hillsborough Transit Center um, that Trey mentioned. Uh, they are working rapidly toward conclusion, and we are aiming for the week of March 28th for a ribbon cutting ceremony. So keep your um, keep your calendars open and your eyes open for that. Uh, we're working with the school district, the mayor's office, to try to give that um, facility a proper send off. You may have been reading some in the newspapers about the participatory budget process that Mayor Cooper initiated in North Nashville. Uh, basically, what Metro did was set aside $2 million of capital spending plan funds for that community to be able to program to specific projects that they were interested in. Um, I want to thank Trey Walker. He represented all the Metro departments had representation in the process. Trey was our representative to that process. And I'm not sure whether it was due, his, due to his salesmanship or just due to the fact that people love him. Um, the neighborhood of North Nashville actually allocated 300,000 of those $2 million toward MTA for stop improvements in the neighborhood. So additional shelters and stop upgrades. Um, unfortunately, one of the things we were cut short on last month was pretty much you lost the Ed and Steve show uh, for our annual January budget workshop. We did send out a lot of the background material. Um, so I hope you had a chance to read that. Certainly if you have any questions, feel free to call Ed or myself or any of the um, staff affected. Because of the timing of Metro's budget process, we are working to get that submission in in February. Um, and kind of dovetailing what Felix and Justin and uh, Dan were reporting on, the approach will be as it has been in the past. So last year, Metro came through, fully restored the funding cut from the prior year, gave us an inflationary increase to ask that the board consider using the pandemic relief money to, to see better bus with the expectation that that seeding would feed into our baseline request for this upcoming year. That will be our approach. And as in past years, we'll have the supplemental investment request to do the next phase better bus uh, changes that, that Justin outlined earlier. So we will keep you posted on that. And we'll give you a bit of a, of, of a review at the February meeting on what was submitted to Metro. Um, we were pleased this past month, we were notified by TDOT that we got two competitive grant awards on the capital side. We got uh, both under the IMPROVE Act. Uh, $900,000 is being allocated to our stop improvement program. So that will leverage the $3 million that we got from Metro and some additional federal money. And another $375,000 toward additional improvements at WeGo Central, which we're going to focus on upgrading the shelters for our outdoor um, bus bays there. You might know there's those two. I call them mushrooms that kind of sit over the top. And they're great as long as it doesn't rain and the, or the wind blow. Um, so they don't offer a whole lot of protection. So we'll essentially be replacing those with more covered uh, structures. <laughs> Somebody rides a route that uh, boards at one of those uh, boards at one of those stops. I can see. Um, planning for another potential regional transit center down in the Hickory Hollow area in the Global Mall site. Um, so we've continued to meet with various stakeholders on that, including I got to meet with uh, council member uh, Joyce Stiles, who covers that area. She's very excited about the project and wanting to partner with us on the broader development of the old Global Mall site. Um, also, we're working with Metro Planning because they are initiating a, an area-wide study to see how that location might redevelop, you know, again, using transit and transportation as a focal point. Been a ton of meetings lately uh, with Metro Planning, Metro Finance, their consultants on the East Bank developments and how transit can be sort of integrated into the design of the East Bank as that project emerges. So I suspect over the coming months, you're going to see a lot of activity, not necessarily specific to WeGo, but certainly more broadly um, on the East Bank site. I want to thank Renuka, Rick, our marketing communications staff, Zeta, and our customer care staff for their involvement. We collaborated with the Mall of Green Hills for a Stuff a Bus event in December. Had Mayor Cooper come down and hand out cookies. Yes, they are cookies, Mary. 
um, to some of our customers. Uh, folks could get their picture taken behind, be with the bus. It was a nice partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank to, to get them, them some um, material for the holidays and also to call attention to the Hillsborough Transit Center. So uh, Renuka's group, we got some great media coverage out of it and it was, uh, it was nice to be able to contribute in that way. Our operations and our development and engineering staffs continue to work with HDR consultants looking at the Nestor facility and what we might do with it. Just a forewarning, that's gonna be an issue that will be hot and heavy on your agendas in the coming months and it is not a simple question. Um, so there will be some pretty intense policy and financial issues and operational issues that we'll be covering with that. <coughs> month of, uh, certainly been a month of staffing transitions in our relationships with the city. Many of you probably saw, we were disappointed to see that we're losing Faye DeMassimo. Um, Faye's going back to her hometown of Savannah, Georgia to actually run the transit agency there. Um, so I think I've uh, effectively corrupted her um, sufficiently uh, in that regard. We also had Diana Alarcon um, start this past month as the new NDOT director. I had the opportunity to meet with Diana and I think she's gonna be a terrific addition to our city and to the mobility argument, but also with NDOT, a couple of folks we worked with for a number of years in different roles, Jeff Hammond and Rochelle Carpenter are leaving for the private sector. So uh, we'll be anxious to see who the new players are. Um, although the process had been a little bit more slow due to COVID and other factors than we may have liked, Gail and Janet, and Margaret and I are actively working toward a board planning workshop um, sometime in the spring. So our next goal is for the um, for our steering committee to get together again on that. So stay tuned. I want to thank Jessica for inviting myself and Michael Skipper to participate in a briefing on the uh, new Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act at the federal level with the Transit Alliance virtually. Um, I think that was good. There was great part, great uh, attendance and great participation. Really good questions. Uh, to which Michael and I mostly could answer, I guess we'll see. Um, so, uh, so lots of things unfolding there. We've continued to receive customer feedback and obtain information relative to our bus stop sign replacement program that you saw that you were briefed on several months ago. I think we're scheduled to come back in February, if I'm not mistaken, Justin, for some kind of final touch up things. And then we want to initiate those installations beginning in the spring. On the RTA side, um, I hesitate to say this because, uh, you know, toward, toward Ed's comments on conflict of interest, it's, it's not a competition, but actually RTA was even more successful with TDOT this year than MTA was. TDOT announced two awards to RTA, $3 million in um, Improve Act funding, $3.4 million in congestion mitigation, federal congestion mitigation funding to keep working on building out our park and ride network uh, on our commuter bus network on that side. I continue to participate with the National Area MPO's Project Delivery Task Force and my RTA role, um, and that, that group continued to meet. Unfortunately, the Titans won't be playing this weekend. I know we're all disappointed with that, but we actually had, in addition to have the Titans having, if, if, if a disappointing, certainly a successful season, so did the WeGo Stars Titans Express. We carried over 6,000 customers to the 10 games this year, including 644 to last uh, weekend's playoff game. I understand from the rail operator that it was a very quiet train on the way home, uh, unfortunately. Uh, also, Andy and his group are working on starting to deploy our new commuter buses that are just being delivered. We've received four of the 10. So they're currently in the process of being prepped um, for service and we'll see those on the road in the coming weeks. The RTA board recently conducted its annual election of officers, reelecting our same officers. Mayor, Hutt Mayor Hutto of Wilson County was reelected chair. Uh, Mayor Paige Brown of the City of Gallatin, Vice Chair, and Davidson County Governor's appointee Ed Cole will continue as Secretary Treasurer. You saw uh, Renuka put at your stations a couple items I'd call your attention to. One is we, we uh, she keeps, her department keeps updating our We Kept Rolling. This is a dynamic thing, even though it's printed at your, um, and, and available at your spots. Um, on the website, this is, and as projects unfold, we continue to add elements to this. And I know if you take a look through here, you kind of hear it month after month, but we're doing an awful lot of stuff. Um, and it's kind of impressive, particularly in the current environment when you see that. I would also call your attention to a little flyer she has and hope that you will join us, uh, as many of you as can, as can uh, next week at Transit Equity Day. We're gonna have Mayor Cooper and several of our elected officials 
um, really kind of take part in a what is a national day of reflection on the importance of uh, transit in the civil rights movement and in terms of overall equity in our society and uh, commemorating Rosa Parks and some of those activities. Um, and then finally, um, one more note. Uh, I always like to end with a good news item. Uh, and I will tell you, this does not start out that way. Uh, but I promise a happy ending. I do want to announce that uh, one, of our, one of our real stalwarts in the company is going to be retiring uh, very soon. Bobby Green, who's our dispatch manager, has been with us since 2002, started as a bus operator, moved into a lead dispatch role in 2005, became the dispatch manager in 2018. I always tell folks in our new class, um, Bobby is, shall we say, follically challenged. Um, and I always tell folks he started with hair down to his waist when he started. Um, he is the one when COVID or snowstorms or general conditions, he's the one responsible to make sure the number of people who know how to drive a bus is about equal to the number of people we need to drive a bus at any given moment in time. And it's a very stressful position. Um, so he oversees that function, has done it with grace and humor. Um, and I think the only way he probably got through that job is he started as a tour bus operator in the country music industry. So nothing that he sees here can scare him. Um, so we're very sad to lose Bobby and his loyalty, but I'm also really proud to introduce, I think he's here. Um, stand up, Carl. Carl Dean, one of our, not that Carl Dean, um, one of our longtime employees. Uh, is being promoted up. Carl recently got his college degree. He has worked a variety of roles in supervision. It's unfortunate we all have to wear masks because the one thing that stands out for Carl is a smile that goes from ear to ear under almost any circumstances. Uh, please enjoy the hair while you've got it. You won't have it long uh, in that job. I do have to tell a story when I first started and how I first met Carl. Of course, many of you know I started when the other Carl Dean, the less famous Carl Dean, was mayor. And I would sit in, I'd get these emails and accident notifications that were copied to a bunch of folks in operations and safety and what have you. And I would see that Carl Dean was copied on these. And I gotta be honest, Gail, I got very nervous. I said, wait a minute, if the mayor is getting every copy of every accident report, I may have walked into the wrong situation. <laughs> so uh, many of you probably remember our COO at the time, Charles Mitchell, tr Charles Mitchell, true gentleman, if there ever was one. I was telling Charles this time, like, does the mayor really get that involved? He just bust out laughing. And he took me over and introduced me to the Carl Dean. Said, this is our Carl Dean. Um, Carl indicated to me he was no relation with Mayor Carl Dean. And uh, since that time, I've always felt a special relationship because probably the main reason I'm still here um, is, is because I found out the Carl Dean who was copied on every accident report was this Carl Dean. So, so congratulations, Carl. Uh, we welcome you. Um, wish you luck and you are now embedded. <laughs> so. Madam Chair, uh, unless there are any questions, that concludes my report. Does anybody have any questions for Steve? Thank you, Steve. Carl, welcome. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Look forward to it. If you need anything from us, please don't ever hesitate. I have a really short report. Um, Mary, thank you for stepping in for Janet today. We wish her well. And Mary, know that you continue to be in our thoughts and hearts as you sort of uh, go through um, thinking about your dad So all the time. So we appreciate you very much. Um, watch a good job today, Jessica. Thank you. You know, I have the best colleagues ever. And grateful to sort of sit on this board with all of you. So we're looking forward to another great year of us all working together. So appreciate it. You all right. You know it, but I would tell you more about how you rock, but it's 4.13 and I'm going to let you go. So y'all live with it, y'all rock, okay? Um, anybody have any questions for me? Margaret, thanks for hanging with us continuously. We appreciate it. Anybody? We good? With that being said, we are adjourned.